Power Project family, I want all of you guys to look good when you work out. You see, I have a problem. I don't like things that aren't quality, and if they're not quality, I don't take care of them. And the awesome thing is that we partner with Viore Clothing. Now, the cool thing about Viore is that it's apparel that I almost feel guilty wearing in the gym, but the great thing and the reason why I love Viore is that, number one, the clothes feel, look, and fit amazing, but number two, even though they're super high quality, they don't break the freaking bank, right? So you can get super high quality clothing and not go into debt trying to get it. <laughs> Andrew, please tell the people how to get it. On top of that, we're going to give you guys an awesome deal with 20% off your first order. Head over to viori.com. That's V-U-O-R-I.com slash power project. And you'll receive 20% off your first order automatically. No code needed. Links to them down in the description, as well as the podcast show notes. Head over there right now. What do you got over there, Andrew? Okay. Sorry about that. All right, we're rolling. We're rolling. Yeah, I forgot my my headphones outside. Cheers mm. oh, for yeah. an amazing Hello. seminar. Come in, come in. Bruh. I'll hit you guys with the uh, root beer over here. You killed oh. it, man. That was man. fucking amazing. You Great job, did. Ben. That was awesome. Thank you guys so much for having me. Yeah. We're doing a little mind bullet shot right here. Down but isn't it sober hatch. October, Mark? Hmm. It was sober October. <laughs> Bring on the fucking strippers and the cocaine and line them up and let's go. He made it. He made, we it, got, uh, he made it. I missed it. We oh. got Ben Patrick, knees over toes guy here. <laughs> we did an awesome seminar today, or we did awesome seminars today. Yeah. That was really uh, fucking spectacular and amazing. What is going on, Ben Patrick? Man, we just finished these seminars. We just coached like hundreds plus people. You have some amazing coaches, by the way. The Thank ATG so has some much. amazing coaches. Yeah, we legit, I mean, the, we'll have all the footage and I think from that we can put out probably the most like helpful regression videos like on YouTube, you know what I mean? I think a lot of videos could be made from what we just did. There was a lot of different folks in there today. Mm -hmm. There were yeah. some people that were advanced. I saw some people pulling off some fucking like Ninja Warrior type shit in there today. And then I saw some All folks levels. that really yeah. were struggling just to bend the knee just a bit. Like what, so what's, um, what do you think is important for people that maybe didn't get to experience a seminar, haven't seen some of your work before? What are some of the most important things for somebody to know just to get started? Like, what does it take? Well, I learned a lot today just from, you know, having to connect and teach that many people all at once. And I'm just going to move this microphone in a little bit better spot so you don't you, have sir. to move around okay. too much. I thought it should be good. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and yeah, about, about 30 of my like, coaches around the world came um, coaching people one-on-one. -on -one. So I got to really have a nice bird's eye view. And it was a realization just thinking about, you know, more common lifts that people think about. So bench, squat, deadlift, these are common lifts people think about. And a good coach, the first time you're learning deadlift, they're not just going to have you try to max out without attention on your form, mm. you know, and they're, they're going to use a weight that you can handle with the right form. So I, I do think that my mission going forward has to be taking the things that I learned that helped me, that I've had to use the abilities that I have to get people to even look at what I'm doing, mm. but now figure out a way that you know, how do I keep people looking at, how do I keep it entertaining enough, but show them how I got there. And it's no different than a, a deadlift. These are all movements that you can teach and you can get someone into at their level, you know, but people aren't often connecting the dot and they're mm. thinking of, they're thinking of the knee as something that you either have some magic trick exercise that works in one session or it doesn't. And in fact, with the knee, we're talking, it's going to take actually in terms of the result, the results will be even slower than a deadlift because the deadlift is going to have more muscles involved. Now we get into the knee and the tendon and the ligament takes longer, longer time to adapt. Mm -hmm. So effectively teaching that, how does the process actually work of getting more capable joints and getting people to understand that these are just fundamental movements, you know, and that's where I feel like the backward walking and the backward sled is a, is a good entrance point, but to realize that all the movements are along that style that you can start doing it. You think someone can just simply walk <laughs> backwards um, without any resistance, and that could be something that could be beneficial to the knee? It does seem like it's the most common starting point that someone can do. Someone can walk. They can probably walk backwards at some level. I've even started showing like what my parents do. They're 64, 67. Is they'll go out somewhere, and one of them will be walking backwards, 
and the other one will be standing to the side of them, holding the hand, walking oh. forwards. So you don't have to worry if you have the proprioception and the stability, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so one, you make sure you have a safe air, and one person can walk backwards, the other can hold the hand. But now if we think of that, and then if we get that comparison to a deadlift. So you have a power lifter putting up a deadlift weight that to most people would be like unthinkable, right? But then you can teach a beginner how to deadlift with proper form. So if we look at my parents, how they walk backwards, that would be a starting point. But then you saw us out here adding weight to a sled going backwards at pretty high speeds and stuff. Well, that's not like your progressed level. Right. So I it's understand like, anyone, anyone can sprint uh, or anyone that can run can figure out a way to sprint, but not everyone's going to look like Usain Bolt. It's not exactly everyone's going right. to be able to produce that amount of power and force. Right. You could teach someone to bench press, not everyone's gonna bench press as much as you bench pressed, you know what I mean? But that's a common lift that people understand that, you know what I mean? People understand and they see the weights you do and they think, they, they see how amazing that is, but they're not thinking that they don't have the ability to bench press, you know what I mean? But with, when it comes to a lot of joint movements, you know, there's such a disconnect between rehab and exercise. So I'm gonna have to keep educating that it's like you actually can do those movements at some level. They can be part of your arsenal. You know, we had John Hack here yesterday and <clears throat> at the end of his workout, he came in <clears throat> and I don't know if you saw, he was doing the backwards sled yeah. work and he was, he was like done afterwards. He had mm -hmm. to get some, we had to give him some electrolytes, but for let's say power specifically, right? What are some of the movements that you think like, cause the whole ATG system has a lot of movements, but if you were to segment four to five potential movements that you think any power lifter can just add into their program and start trying to progress those movements to help with explosive strength. What do you think those movements would be? So it's so perfect for power thing because power thing, they're already understanding form and progressive overload and, and getting strong. And so they're already putting in so much work mm -hmm. that we can fill some of these gaps, yeah. you know, and then you're just creating like a superhuman, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And I do think that the the backward sled is the simplest one. So for a power lifter, you know, okay, I talked about my parents holding hands and doing the backward walking. That may help keep them healthy for walking, you know, maybe going downstairs, stuff like that. For a power lifter, then to be, handle, be able to handle those weights over time, what's like almost the opposite of powerlifting well backward sled for high repetitions getting blood flow when you when you walk backward like your knee goes over your toe you're doing you're, hundreds of repetitions yeah and you're, yeah. you're digging toe first like when you go to step backward and you push your toe you're going toe first into the ground mm -hmm. so you're hitting into some nooks and crannies there that you're not doing with the squat and the deadlift so so powerlifters often feel really good by doing a 10 minute backward walk with resistance at a level they can handle where did this entire thing come from? Knees over <clears throat> toes. Like we were, you know, we were taught, we've had you on the show before, but we were taught that, uh, you know, especially when you're squatting, um, as it pertains to like a heavy weight, it's really not a great idea, some people think, to not have your knee travel past your toe. So where did, how did you start to come to some of these conclusions? Well, if we trace it all the way back. Okay, we know that um, in Asia, they've walked backwards for thousands of years. We know that much. And it, it's actually like a, a saying from there that like 100 steps backwards is worth a thousand steps forwards. So it's like part of a, you know, a Chinese saying. And it was simply passed down from generation to generation. So we don't know like exactly where exactly where that came from. But it was passed down from generation to generation. So we know that's been used for thousands of years. And that's a very low level of knees over toes training. And they found it to be very successful for you know preventing degenerative issues. Then exercise itself, when you start to look into the history, they're getting into the late 1800s. There was kind of movements almost like along the lines of gymnastics and stuff. It kind of like where the, the idea of, because I mean, at a certain point we weren't thinking about fitness. We were, you know, out in the field working. Movement, mm -hmm. maybe right. gymnastics Ooh. slash calisthenic right. stuff. Right, so eventually there came like almost like a like a movement of the idea of like almost exercise. You know what I mean? Like like mostly we're just getting ready for war, like prepare, like, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So was, there was war and farming. And so like most of us would have had to actually have a pretty physical lifestyle. Like I don't think a farmer would have been like, now let me get my exercise in uh. at the end of the day. Like they're done, <laughs> they did their exercise. So, 
that there was a lot of you know free body movement at that time um and it was mostly body weight based like there's even like for example there's a picture of a nordic hamstring curl dating back to 1880 excuse me yeah nordic, really? yeah <laughs> yeah wow yeah my my nordic hamstring curl tutorial on youtube um it, it starts by showing a picture of that like it was originally and and who knows how long they were using but there's a picture of it in a book from 1880 wow. Okay, so if you only have your own body, you end up working a lot of different areas. You're not really thinking about like, don't do this or don't do that. Mm -hmm. So as weights became popular and lifting weights, and like, for example, we can just look at it like in powerlifting, has anyone ever set a record going rock bottom knees over toes? I don't think so. I've never, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So you're gonna have to, gravitate to do things to succeed at what you're trying to do mm. so for a power lifter trying to train your squat knees over toes you're on a track that like i don't think anyone's ever success succeeded that way you know then for an olympic weightlifter though because you have to catch the bar it's basically you explode the bar up and now the lower you can drop the more room you have mm. to catch that bar see if you can bring up shane hammond squat thousand pound squat um, there there have been some power lifters that kind of use that rock bottom thing but like most of the time it's it's very very rare um, and even so even if when they do drop in those positions uh, a lot of times they're not you know aggressively like shoving their knees over their toes but I think for the most part and we'll get to it in a minute but well, let's watch this insane squat done by um, one of the all time great American Olympic lifters Shane Hammond well, wow. yo, don't <laughs> blink. Wow. But if you rewind it one more time, very deep. He, he, if he smashes it, it's super deep. If you rewind it one more time, you'll kind of notice he does push the hips back and it's a low bar squat. Mm -hmm. And so it still kind of falls in line with what you said. I mean, his knees travel forward. They're not traveling past the toes, though, just to kind of prove yeah. your point further. In that Olympic position, when, when he was down and doing snatches and things like that, his knees are. <laughs> that's fucking crazy his <laughs> knees are definitely way uh over his toes yeah so so those would be two different sports and the knee angles would be very different mm -hmm. so you just kind of get into a situation in life where i just think it's a fundamental mistake if you say this is right and that's wrong when people are clearly succeeding at two mm -hmm. different things mm -hmm. so if you're if your knee it's going to be in life, say, going downstairs. And you are going to be doing a bunch of other training. And now you're not doing anything for your knees over your toes. Then you might wind up, I've seen people like pretty strong people, but there's pain going down the stairs. Mm -hmm. So, okay, I wasn't in powerlifting, I was in basketball. Your knees are over your toes like every time you try to jump. Like, for example, like there's for, for like a two footed jump in the NFL. There's no such thing as a 40 inch vertical without knees over toes. It's and there's, and I, I want to add, there's no squat in there either. Like you're not trying to squat exactly. down to the floor. Exactly. I that think wouldn't we've, make any sense. I think we've almost, and look, this is at the end of a long day, you know, hopefully I don't <laughs> like say something too wild, but like, I think we've almost, I think the more we've tried to, you have shirts that say like, think less. Mm -hmm. I think we've thought ourselves to like a dumber level. Oh, where, it's just, <laughs> where it's just like, like good. Like you train for powerlifting. Like that's, that's fucking awesome. Like that's, there's Great, so that's your head. sport. Like, yeah. and this is basketball, and this is Olympic weightlifting, and so I'm just trying to create a system that would be used as accessory for any of those. You know what I mean? W what I do in my training is not enough volume to have the muscle mass that both of you have. So, anything I'm doing, you could add, <laughs> like, to what you're doing. I do it so then I can play basketball without pain, heading toward a different life with my kid that I know I'm not just going to be doomed to be the dad on the sidelines. I can, you know, I can be there with him and be active, you know? So I do think that the whole system of fitness does need a non-competitive system where the idea is just to help people do what they want to do without pain. Mm -hmm. So whether you're a power lifter or Olympic weightlifter, if someone has a knee pain, you know, I think they're going to enjoy the backward sled, for example. It's not like, the, it's not like, you should be telling them how they should do the lift. They should have an expert coach in that lift. I don't know if you're aware of this, but you have a really amazing ability to connect the dots um, <clears throat> from starting backwards. So it's interesting that you talk often about 
walking backwards and and uh, backward sled dragging because everything that you do and everything that you established is kind of backwards. Uh, yeah. The knees aren't supposed to go over the toes. It's very dangerous. And you're like, well, um, maybe for some circumstances, the knees over toes isn't a great idea. Maybe in the case of you're lifting weights and you're doing a squat and you're squatting as much weight as possible. That's already proven that it's not advantageous to be knees over toes. The powerlifting yeah. squat, they're, the top powerlifters are lifting more weights. And so they're proving that if the goal is to lift the most weight, well then, you know, it's right there on the tape what they're doing. You know what if I mean? you want to have a more vibrant knee and you want to have a knee that has better longevity and has better joint and just health integrity in general, it sounds like it's a good idea to investigate shoving the knee yeah. over the toe. Yeah, when when you bend a joint all the way, you simulate you stimulate to the body to send synovial fluid to the area to bring nutrients to the area. Your body assumes you're using that joint. And I mean, if, if you just look across the amount of messages I get now on, on YouTube from places where, because a lot of people seem to be on YouTube in like all kinds of countries. Yeah. And places where the elderly, everyone, like you sit down in a deep squat. You know what I mean? But in America, like we have chairs, like <laughs> you won't go to Starbucks and see people like down in a deep squat. Mm -hmm. And so many people there, they're older people. Sure, they're still going to have problems, but their older people are fascinated at like how broken down other older people are all over the world. So like, I'm sorry, but like a, a deep squat is like a natural human position. That doesn't mean the idea is to abuse that, but a full knee bend with the knee over toe, these are, these are natural human positions, but it doesn't mean that you then try to change the form of a powerlifter squat, but it means that a powerlifter could identify which accessory exercises make them feel better. You know? You'll like this. This is said by Steve Jobs. You can't connect the dots moving forward. You can only connect the dots once you look back. And that's when everything will appear in the right sequencing to you. And you go, it must have been that way the whole time. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, you're right. And that's, I think, my contributions are not forward advancements. They're backward advancements, <laughs> to, mm -hmm. you know. Um, the, the things like the reverse step-ups, they really can scale to any level. Yeah. It's just like a fundamental. So we're really just identifying... I don't really want to coach something unless it's like a natural human movement mm -hmm. and then try to make that scalable. But it has to be said that the majority of people struggling in life that I've talked to about any issue that they're struggling with, they think that there's that success is a sort of um, instant gratification thing, you know, that they're entitled that just by saying I participated in blah, it should equal blah, you know. Oh, I did that business course didn't work for me like that that instant gratification entitled type attitude would directly lead you to think no knees over toes ever that's a hard position so we're going to avoid it but it, it's really like the the things you're you're weakest at and worst at and stuff like that that's where you have the room to grow but of course there's more short-term risk if you try to force into it mm -hmm. but long term you're shooting yourself in the foot long term if you take your weaknesses and then you avoid them. So it's very natural to see how no knees over toes could have spread in a sort of instant gratification, you know, don't face our weaknesses, not long-term approach world. Mm -hmm. The first thing is that, like you mentioned, honestly, all the stuff that you're doing within that we were doing in the gym, any sport, any athlete in any sport can take this and benefit in their sport from jujitsu, basketball, yeah. powerlifting, whatever, grappling. Any sport can take any of this stuff, any of these movements, progress them slowly and progress with it. But you know, we had Joel Seaman on the podcast. Mm -hmm. And the cool thing is that when we were, you know, we were talking back and forth, because Joel has said like, you know, this is the ideal joint angle and, or the 90 degrees, the, the mm -hmm. ideal joint angle, right? Mm -hmm. And when we were talking to him, it was it was cool to understand some of his concepts are, make a lot of sense. When you work with a lot of professional athletes, right, who need to get in and out, and maybe they need to work with heavy loads, maybe squatting all the way down with 500 pounds wouldn't be ideal, but maybe going to a 90 degree joint angle is. Mm -hmm. um, but he did mention something that we talked about. He mentioned how like if you go to those deep joint angles too often, it would lead to degradation, right? But that's only within the context of an athlete maybe trying to progress it too quickly. You know, if we exactly. look at too quickly, exactly. If we look at your progressions, if you progress it with no pain slowly over time, no athlete's gonna get injured with that. Yeah, and, and life is supposed to be with challenges. Things can still happen. But yeah. We look at certain percentages out there in sports and mm -hmm. and the 90 degree angle thing is actually that's not new that's actually like 
how guys have been training in sports mm. for a long time now. Yeah. You know? And so like is ninety degree angle like the optimal position or whatever? Like, well, maybe for strength it, it might be the optimal position mm -hmm. to be that our body is like strongest in. Yeah. But now if we create an imbalance where now we're not stimulating certain parts. So I like I think the the whole range is, of motion is important. Meaning someone could criticize Joel for, you know, working on the 90 degree angle, but how much stuff did we do today that was less than 90 degree angle? Yeah. Someone could laugh at me for 100 being, reps. For we did 100 reps that's at just pulses. 15 degree angle. Yeah. That's less than 90 degree angle, but we also then did full bend. So I mean, there's just no advantage to being weak in an area. And the 90 degree angle is probably the most overused section of strength. Mm. Think how we line up for a deadlift, think how we get into a squat. So the, the 90 degree area is used a lot. And so most people have a lot of potential to really get new stimulation for the tendons and gradually build up stronger ligaments by working sort of the end ranges. Can you explain that a little bit? Because we've had people where we've mentioned that and we've talked about that, but people don't understand why, like, why does this not, why is it not just working the muscle? Why is it working the tendons and the ligaments and strengthening those over time? Because many people don't think that you can really strengthen those. They think that yeah. after they start to degrade, yeah. they're just gonna get worse as you get older. Yeah. So if we think about um, the Achilles is the biggest tendon in our body. Mm -hmm. And when we get into calf work where the knee is more bent now and the load is now like on the Achilles, well, you now also end up with more load on that soleus muscle, that lower, deeper calf muscle. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there's a there's a brilliant study from 2019. Well, I don't know if brilliant is the right word, but it makes it really clear that people weaker at extending that foot have more Achilles tendonitis and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, and not, not just at extending the foot, but then within weakness extending the foot, weakness extending the foot in like a bent knee rather than a straight legged position. So like when, when you now start to load that knee over toe, and load the calf now that weight is like going into the achilles meaning there is load on our muscles tendons ligaments when we're when we're doing just about anything mm. and if you now go into like a much deeper position or something like that you're now going to put it's like if someone who had like tendonitis they would feel the pain in those areas you know you reach it's like someone with tendonitis they reach the knee over toe they're going to feel pain in that area now if they sit back into like a 90 degree position, not letting the over toe, they might be able to keep the pressure more on the muscles. So there does simply have to be like, when you go into these more quote unquote extreme sort of ranges, there's then more, your muscle can only go so far. And so there's more pull on the tendons and the ligaments. So it's just sort of a, a stimulus thing. You still feel the muscle, but um, you're, you're now stimulating more into the tendons and the ligaments but then we need to be strong in those areas to be protected. So someone could probably take, someone who you know has really deeply studied muscles, tendons, ligaments, could probably do some fantastic stuff to see you know, which exercises work which things. But yeah, if, if you just sit back you know, on a squat, you are gonna be winding up using more muscle than if you just reach your knees forward and like, oh, my knee hurts there, right? Mm -hmm. so, so scaling those qualities because in sport and life, we wind up in those positions. So we can build those up and then the very tendon can develop and grow. And there's been some stuff, they didn't even have a name for it, but there's even like pictures in the study of, of people doing reverse step ups, like exactly like we were coaching today. They didn't even have a name for it. It was just like step down off the box this way, you know what I mean? And now there's been like the Peterson step up and the Poliquin step up and, the and now they, step up. yeah. And, well, my name happens to be Patrick. It kind of works out. <laughs> it kind of works out. You got three. But the point is that they found that the, that like the patellar tendon would actually regenerate and grow and strengthen. So it's it's almost like if you said, like, here's probably a, a simple way to think about like what would put pressure on your tendons or ligaments. Think about in your body, like what movements would hurt? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Because um, when someone says, oh, my knee hurts, they're not talking about their their quad muscles hurt. You know what I mean? They're usually talking about their quad tendon, their patellar tendon, or they had, oh, I had my MCL or my ACL or this or that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's almost like you're thinking, what shit hurts your body? And then how do we scale that back to a level that doesn't hurt your body? And then we get stronger at that. I mean, that's really, 
if you just scratched everything I rambled about for the last five minutes and took that statement, that would almost be a simple way of thinking about it. You know what I mean? Yes. Like what would hurt your joints? Like what would hurt your shoulder, your elbow, your this, your that? And then, and then how do we scale that down to a level that doesn't hurt and then train it? And that's actually phys- a lot of physical therapists really understand that concept. So actually quite a few of the people here today who were, you know, um, we're so appreciative of this stuff are physical therapists because they they duplicate this data and they're able they're using it they're using atg with like amazing results with their patients because they understand how to apply it so atg doesn't work or not work everything we do out there can work or could not work Mm. depending on how it's applied Mm -hmm. and that's probably the simplest way to explain it's like we're taking the things that hurt and then finding the level that doesn't i think you know there's something very simple that people can think about is there's a risk reward factor you know with everything but there's a reason why it's called risk to reward in life in general you don't really get the reward without at least some risk and so while we we want to encourage people to move pain free we want to encourage people to uh, get better ranges of motion um, it's you're you're doing so in a in a fashion as if you were to be putting your mother or your grandmother through a training session. You're not trying to white knuckle these things. You're not trying to, there's actually a a bunch of individuals today that were doing the Astagrass split squat. And I went over to them and I just put my hand on their shoulder and I said, relax your neck. You know, and and I said, okay, hold on a second. Just let's have you start the exercise over, okay? I want you to breathe. I want you to concentrate on just really relaxing. I said, you were, you were wincing through your face a lot. You actually were, you had some good movement there. It was a great movement pattern. But when you got to a place of discomfort, you went, you know, and it looked like you were taking a poop. <laughs> and when you uh, clench up the old butthole like that, it's, it's not, <laughs> that's not a great way to demonstrate uh, how, how mobile you can be. And so, Smart. I heard Nsema talk about before, which I have not thought about before, but I know about kind of relaxing the face, but relaxing the eyes. I was like, oh, that's a, that's a really awesome cue. And so I told the guy, I said, well, you know, relax your eyes and just, and he went to get in position again and he moved quite a bit further and he was like, wow, that's really making a, and it's just sometimes that encouragement to, uh, to people, but just having those tools can allow you to take these little es- extra risks that will give you that little extra w- reward. The hard part sometimes is, is like, how iffy do we want this to get? And I do think that Joel Seedman brings up a lot of really interesting points. Mm-hmm. It is really important for people to understand <clears throat> if you don't work on mobility that often or that much or at all, and you go to do a, a an Olympic lifting style squat and you're a person who's tight like myself, you are giving up position. Um, but the question now is giving up pos- position for what? You know, are you are you just on a slant board with no weight? Because, my God, if that throws you off and that gets you hurt, then you got some you have a lot of uh, current issues that need to be addressed. You're just not a very healthy person. Life is going to be pretty risky. Life is going to be risky. Everything's going to be kind of hurting, right? And yeah. it's unfortunate for people that can't move in those positions. But you most likely can do a lot of these things with a 20-pound dumbbell, a 40-pound, a 60-pound kettlebell. Most of what we were doing was body weight today. Yeah, and, yeah. We're, and we're all doing body and, weight. And so the, you, the sleds even reduce. It's almost like negative body Like that heavy forward sled drive. You can't move without your knee going over your toe but you kind of get to lean your weight against it. It's slow. Yeah, it's exactly right. And that's, we complimented Joel Seedman's coaching of how, you know, how much he gets guys to control the weights. Mm -hmm. He's getting guys to control heavy weights. I'm not trying to compete against him or compete against anyone. The movements we did today are just trying to fill that gap in the system of how do we improve at those areas we stink at. And And there's a risk involved in doing anything, but, when we do that, how much does that reduce our risk going forward for the long term? So I do. I always believe there's a solution. And as I explained, uh, and I saw you explain the same exact thing uh, today. You want your uh, ability, like your um, your current uh, 
ability to demonstrate strength or mobility to be able to move upward, but you're not, your performance is not ramming and slamming up against that. You are continually elevating yourself. You're continually elevating uh, your, um, your capacity. You have a larger capacity, but for the most part, you don't really ever go to full capacity. There, there's usually not a lot of great reasons. You're not going to get the training stimulus even that you're looking for. When you think about some of the greatest sprinters and some of the greatest uh, explosive athletes that we've ever seen, um, and even a lot of power lifters, it's mm -hmm. really rare for them to go above their capacity. You want to develop an, an incredible work capacity, work beneath that, occasionally brush up close to it and say, ooh, that was, that was maybe a little too much, but you know, luckily I got the rep or lucky I was able to do that thing. That is how you improve. And I think that it's hard to uh, be composed. It's hard to kind of stay in your lane and relax and just let that happen that way. Mm -hmm. That's a great way of putting it with the capacity. And it makes me think of the backward sled, you know, which we've talked to death. But it's like the idea with that is that, sure, people have got people can reduce pain in a session of doing it. But that's not that's not the purpose of it. You know, I've done over 100 miles of it which now I got to start keeping track again. It's probably getting close to 200 miles. <laughs> um, that's capacity of knees over toes. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Um, that you're trying to build on these capacities and then, um, then you're going to find all of a sudden things that maybe to someone else looks really difficult is actually quite easy for you, but that's no different than anything else you try to get good at. You know what I mean? You know, back in February when I started doing this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. When I started with the tibialis raises, first mm -hmm. off, I when I, I wanted to move to the tip bar, but doing the reps on the wall, mm -hmm. that itself was like, oh, fuck, I didn't have the capacity to be able to do 50 reps without having mm -hmm. to stop. Andrew Huberman came into and did a podcast with us. And he was mentioning, oh, my back's hurting. But, you know, I realized whenever I do tib work, my lower back pain goes away. Usually when I have back pain, when I do some tib work, my back pain goes away. <laughs> So I wanted to ask mm -hmm. you, because when he said that, I was like, oh shit, so he's he's doing that tip stuff. Too. So like what, like first off, I feel like that's one of Bro, the most such under, a good point. it's most underused things that you brought to my attention. Why should people start paying attention to the tips and how can it make a difference for them athletically? Well, you brought up such a good point, which is that my whole philosophy is not to like spot treat the knee. I think we're trying to work everything. Mm -hmm. And so if someone had a really weak tibialis, then just by the nature of it, if you just thought about, if you thought about walking and then like you flexed your toes up for a second, you see your tibialis flexing. Mm -hmm. If the tibialis was weak, you're gonna feel it, let that foot, boom. Now the knee, the hip, something, it's yeah. gotta go somewhere. And so not only is there no advantage to being weak, there's definitely not advantage to being weak coming from the ground up, like weak feet, weak ankles, weak tibs, weak calves, weak, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, so, depending on what someone's doing, what their past sports were, we could have extreme imbalances. We could have strong calves, but weak tibs, or, you know, there's there's all kinds of imbalances we could have that we've been through. And so, no, it's not, the way I think about hip pain is not by what exact exercise we're gonna use for the hip. Maybe that's gonna be involved in it. But like every program I do, we're, we're hitting, we're trying to hit all these areas. We just don't wanna have any weak links. Mm -hmm. When you eliminate all your weak links, things tend to feel a lot better. And then you don't have to be, I mean, you guys are gonna have to explain to me the think less thing, but I've seen a lot of those shirts around here and think less, but like people who are thinking too much about why the heck they have their pain. Yet meanwhile, they got a bunch of weak links that they're just not putting the work on. They're not putting the capacity. I mean, that's a really good word capacity. I mean, use that a lot. Your results with these ATG unorthodox things come from the work you put in for your capacity on them building up that capacity, not just the fact that you can show something extreme. And I think you guys got to see a lot of guys could do some of this extreme stuff. Like it's yeah. very impressive to see these coaches who have been doing it for a few years. But that's what people, that's what gets the views on social media. So I'm kind of stuck in this world that now I can show what I'm capable of, but it's built on all this basic capacity stuff. It's not built from maxing out on that stuff, you know? Then when it's time and the camera's on, you need to do something. But that's no different than throwing down a dunk and now you're landing, you know, in awkward position. Your knee is in a super tough place. I mean, landing from jumps is like huge impact. Mm -hmm. Like if you watch like <clears throat> Russell Westbrook, he's one of the most aggressive NBA players. And he dunks so aggressively that he's still kind of running in the air. So he doesn't just land. 
He's not just landing. He's landing one leg first. Wow. Imagine if you went in for your strength training session and the coach said, okay, depth jump, super proven exercise. So we're going to do a 40 inch box depth jump on one leg. You're going to land, right? That would destroy some people. You could create patellar tendonitis. You could, so, but look at, he's able to do that. And so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to put in the capacity mm -hmm. that whatever that thing is in life that you're doing, you're not going to have that quote unquote freak injury or the chronic pain that you can't even sleep through the night. I mean, I don't care if someone can do one of these, you know, I don't care what someone can show off about. There's not, that's not the goal. That's not what it's for. However, we're in the world where that tends to get more views. So that's, that's kind of the challenge going forward is I have to effectively teach better. So this is, I mean, just spending time with you here, just on chit chatting right now on the podcast has given me lots of different ideas, you know, of how to explain this stuff. Mm. And capacity is one of them that's not being discussed with knees over toes training. The best results come from actually the simplest, most enjoyable exercises that you get into, that you love doing, that it's fun to do, and building up a large capacity of those. Hi, Project Familia. How's it going? Now, if you are part of fitness YouTube, you have most definitely heard of TRT or testosterone replacement therapy. Now, there are a lot of clinics out there that will go ahead and they'll give everybody the same exact plan, which is not safe because we are all different people. That's why we here at The Power Project have partnered with Merrick Health. Merrick Health is owned by More Dates, More Dates, or Derek for More Plates, More Dates. And the great thing about them is that they take every single patient, they test them, they figure out what exact plan will work for them, and they give them the exact dosages and plan that's going to be specific to them. You must check them out. Andrew, yeah. tell the people how to get it. Absolutely. So you guys got to head over to MerrickHealth.com. That's M A. R-E-K health.com. And if you are considering something like TRT, you can actually fill out a questionnaire. You can tell them your symptoms and uh, they're not just going to be like, oh, you're tired. Cool. Here you go. No, you're going to hop on the phone with an uh, actual like client care coordinator. And then from there, they're going to tell you which labs that you're going to need to actually do and get to figure out where your levels are. And then when it comes to paying for those labs, if you're talking to them on the phone, you can just mention Power Project 15. Or if you do the manual checkout, you can enter promo code Power project 15 and that'll save you 15 percent off all of these labs so really um and Seema said this is like the absolute best way to go about it and it really is this is the premium telehealth trt clinic links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes head over there right now why uh so many reps why 100 repetitions because we're to kill us because we're newbies at it <laughs> you wouldn't you wouldn't build a gymnast without putting in the reps you know so what I mean? then the answer uh, from a technical standpoint is to reduce the intensity, reduce mm -hmm. the, you don't have a lot of resistance when you're yeah. doing a hundred repetitions. Yeah. Something I, I find, I find all these things be super fascinating about you and the way that you deliver your message. And I don't, I don't know if people really understand because you don't talk in a sciencey way, which is much appreciated, but you know, I, I think that people might not understand the nuances to some of the stuff that you're sharing, a hundred repetitions of only moving a couple of inches uh, is providing a is providing a great stimulus because the volume is still really high. The intensity is low, mm -hmm. but because the work is not over a great distance, it's not like we're doing a burpee. Mm -hmm. You can think about how much distance the body travels when you do a burpee and what's mm -hmm. all involved in that exercise. Mm -hmm. It's actually a, br a brilliant movement for that reason and costs you a lot of energy. But when we're moving in a much shorter rhythmic fashion, you are getting so much, like you're using it as a weapon. Like mm -hmm. we're gonna pump this area, you said to me last mm -hmm. time you were here, let's get such a pump that you can't even like figure out how to hurt yourself, <laughs> which is amazing. Like I have so many, we get so many questions about elbow pain and knee pain. And yeah. I'm not saying that any of this is gonna uh, totally fix you or totally 100% out of the gate, uh, work for you but what i will say for sure is it will mitigate whatever pain you have in your elbow or whatever pain you have in your knee do a ton of reps of like a band tricep push down great point that one right there do a fucking ton of that's them what short I, little range of motion that's what i've been using to fix my 64 year old dad's we're talking 30 years of elbow tendonitis from painting so many walls i was getting uh, you know that was part of my journey is, uh, you know, 10 years ago, I was painting walls, not yeah. a trainer, not playing basketball, trying to figure out how to play basketball without my knees hurting. 
when I you, watched my dad with this elbow pain for so long. Mm. If someone has ever experienced that, something as simple as a band tricep extension, where the tension is really just at the end there. You know what I mean? So, and you can get a lot of repetitions and get that blood in. You move, when you move further, you, you use less weight typically. Mm -hmm. When you move less, you can use higher, um, you can use higher repetitions. You know, when somebody does like a full, a full squat, um, again, the, there's a certain amount of volume. If Nseem and I were both squatting and he's going as low as his body can handle, and I'm going as low as my body can handle, and we're both using 315 pounds, he would get better results because he's jacked. But he would get better results because he's moving further. And so people sometimes don't understand that the, the, the actual distance that you move is part of this volume and intensity mm -hmm. and uh, overall workload equation as well. You know, I, I want to know if you could explain the, uh, the ideas of short, uh, short range and long range strength, yeah. because you talk about that a lot, but I don't think some people and that know was, what that means. That was perfect that Mark brought up like the band tricep extension. Mm -hmm. So this is something like we could all go experience right now and do like do a hundred, you know, band yeah. tripod extensions. So if you look at the band and you look at your moving hand, where does it get tougher? At that end when the tricep is, is in a shortened position. Mm -hmm. Now it's just like, I like doing deep, doing dips nice and deep. That shit is quote unquote fixed my elbow shoulder pains is actually where I can do dips like ass to grass dips where my where my bicep like closes my forearm but like I put a public video of that on YouTube two weeks ago and I took it down quickly because so mm -hmm. many people because I realized holy it's a whole new education process so many people were slamming for how's for that, that fixing my knee mm -hmm. well they were saying they were <laughs> saying that's going to destroy elbows that's going to destroy shoulders even yeah. though that's even though that got rid of my shoulder and elbow pain but that's the long range. And now if you think, I don't know if you ever did like like ring push-ups or something. Mm. Now, if you walk out further, my mom is 67 and she loves her ring push-ups because she's walking, I mean, she's quite literally about what we're looking at right here. I've trained so many old ladies in person. And so it was upsetting, but I realized I had to communicate it better that I'm doing the same thing, now taking the elbow through a long range. That is huge for bulletproofing and getting over chronic pains. But for the short term, to get the blood plump and get the, the process started, something like that band. So if you think a band tricep extension, where's it hardest? In that short range. Mm -hmm. But now a dip, when the people see you go real deep, that's now getting into a longer range. It doesn't mean the exercise is an absolute, like meaning you might still have tension at different parts. But the point is that, okay, a super deep push-up or a super deep dip or something like that would be considered a long range exercise, whereas then the band tricep extension would be a short range. And so really it's about understanding both of those and then understanding that those long range, like imagine if someone on a push up could only go a few inches, they couldn't go all the way down. How protected do you think their shoulder and elbow is gonna be, right? Yeah. So, so for bulletproofing, that is part of it, is how do we get to be able to handle those long ranges pain free? but the short range can really help us get into it. The backward sled, the band tricep extension, those are short range exercises. The super deep push up or, or um, ass to grass split squat, those are long range exercises mm -hmm. that tend to scare people, but yet those ones actually is what really gets a deeper level of synovial fluid all the way into the joint itself. But the short range can pump it up and get that process started and get the tendon healing so that we can even handle the long range without pain. But a, just a half rep push up, that mid range, that's where we're like most overtrained in that mid range. That's where the muscle is going to be like most engaged. So if someone, someone with elbow pain, this would be like a general one, but someone with elbow pain, you do a lot of like, like half rep push ups, like half rep on dumbbell. Like they, they, all of it's like right here. Mm -hmm. So the tension's not really at the top, not really at the bottom. If they were to open up and regress push ups and really open up and then regress, you know, like, band tricep extensions or you know even there's um like like you're working on this this row thing where you're really engaging you know mm -hmm. at, at that that end position you're now just you're filling in the weak links so at the end of the day like you just won't most people in pain have some serious like weak links there so again i think and i think that's why it doesn't take fancy terminology to explain that stuff is that you know if you're in pain in these different areas and you have weak links that you can't get into that's how you're gonna get out of the pain. That's how you're gonna improve. Whether, and, and I think the short range, long range helps kind of simplify that rather than having to get too fancy on like, 
what's occurring in the tendon names and the ligament names and all this stuff. Most of us spend most of our time in the mid range and less time in the short range and the long range. I just want to point out quickly that bands are really great in a sense, like in the case of the banded tricep pushdown, mm -hmm. completely unloaded, zero, you have zero, you know, nothing is giving you any sort of resistance, doesn't hurt at all. And then it uh, progresses as you push downward towards the floor. Mm -hmm. It goes from zero pounds to five pounds to 20 and so mm -hmm. on. And maybe at lockout, maybe you have a, you know, 80 or 100, depending on the type of band that you get. And so for people that have injuries, this is an amazing way to work through an injury. You have individuals uh, at the seminar who are also using the infinity band uh, that we have here to. at markbusslingshot.com. Uh, I'm you were buying some... those up, by the way. I'm buying those up and I'm actually adding it to my program. I'm not fucking around. Like this is like. I'm... And you're doing a leg curl with it. So you have, yeah. again, you have zero, zero resistance, no knee pain. Even if you're. Everyone can start that. You, you Everyone can start, can start there, that. And, and that's a short range, you. right? It gets tougher as your knee flexes to work that hamstring. And that we have to credit Louis Simmons at, at Westside for, you know, and I don't know if he just came up with it or whatever, but I, I think he sure as heck popularized that, mm. you know? So hey, Louis Simmons came up with the bands. And do you know the story on that? I don't. All right. Well, here we go. Story How time. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, awesome. So are you aware of the name Dick Hartzell at all? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So Dick, Dick Hartzell, uh, he owned a company called Jump Stretch. That's right. Dick Hartzell used to, he used <clears throat> to be kind of like a, like, a, like a PT. He would help people with like physical therapy. Um, he had unorthodox things. Uh, we got to credit this man with a lot of things. So um, the uh, the wrapping of a joint where you wrap it for a while and you and then you kind of move your body around like with voodoo a, flossing, like voodoo flossing. So he initiated he, that. Uh, as far as that I know, concept. that's the yeah. first time I ever saw it. You know, twenty years ago, maybe even longer. I think he used to do similar stuff like that on the ankle as well. And yeah, yeah, yeah. He he actually, I think even online, there's a video of him doing it to my ankle at the wow. Arnold. Is I don't remember when it was, but I remember it was like it felt like it felt like magic when mm -hmm. he did it to me. Um, so Louis, Louis doesn't he doesn't care about basketball. Louis was a big football fan, and he loves powerlifting, and he loves like fighting and stuff. Uh, but somebody one, at one point said, you should go check out this basketball guy. He talks a lot about like force production and being able to accelerate um, at a really crazy rate. And Dick Hartzell, in his older years, would lay down on the ground, take a band, and he would take his leg and he'd boom, he'd put his leg up like right next to his I head. I remember. I know exactly what you're he talking about. He could move like crazy. He could, he could demo this stuff. Oh, he would yeah. demo shit and he would jump like yeah. a madman. And you're like, like he just like a little old man, you know, yeah. he looked fit, but you weren't expecting anything like that to go on. And you're like, oh my God. And so Louis actually went to one of these seminars, which is amazing because again it's really important that you have a white belt mentality no matter how far advanced you think you are mm -hmm. there's always more shit to learn mm -hmm. louis at the time already had 900 pound squatters and so on right um but he thought hey i should go to this seminar he went to the seminar he saw dick hartzell he saw these bands and he thought to himself i could attach those bands to a bar I could actually do a lot of my favorite movements, bodybuilding movements and movements to get a lot of blood flow Genius. and help with restoration and help recover. The, the restoration stuff came from Dick Hartzell as well, but Louie was the one that kind of took it and put it on the, Look, on the bar. He's doing, he's doing the exact kind of work we're talking about. How good would that I, I think we have, to create, we have to create a new mindset on this shit. YouTube makes it seem like one person and, and opinions and this and that like if we want to be the best we can be we got to be, have an open mind and be learning from everyone and taking the best pieces and then ourselves being the best coach we can be not criticizing or debating someone else from joel seedman i got incredible attention to controlling what he's doing yeah you know look at this now dick hartzell it starts here and it, it, it's so genius with the stuff we're talking about and then there's a couch then, stretch laying on the ground Louis, that he just popped into. Louis was smart enough not to have ego that he wasn't doing it, but to actually look, be looking at how could that, how could he become an even better coach from doing that? So I'll say right now, like, like I'm not perfect. My eyes are open. I'm going to keep getting better. I don't have to criticize anyone else to make that happen. And I'm, I'm going to say this. I live first off, love that you do that because man, there are a lot of individuals that they have great things that they're talking about. 
But then it seems to me, per, to be perfectly honest, when I pay attention to this stuff, then I hear them shit talk somebody else who has some great stuff going on. I'm like, why, why do you have to try to tear down what they're doing when you guys can just maybe marry some fucking ideas? Yeah. Is it that difficult? You know, I'm actually curious about this, though, Ben, because um, yeah. uh, I think a lot of things like you've talked about the feet and I haven't like, where do you think people can start? working on things with their feet and especially within basketball because like i see basketball shoes right and they seem really padded you know i i i mean maybe you could explain why that's necessary for the sport but um, a lot of athletes seem to be using shoes and footwear that's making their feet weaker because they can't get in contact with the ground so what do you think athletes are missing on as far as like their actual foot strength and maybe the things that they're wearing on their feet as far as performance is concerned so if we'll take this in order of importance okay so the shoe, definitely a factor that I think needs to improve, mm -hmm. but it wouldn't be the highest I would put on importance. The highest I would put on importance is realizing that your feet have muscles in them. Yeah. Your feet have tendons in them. They're gonna have to be trained if you're training the rest of your body. You're gonna have to train your feet to keep up so they don't wind up being a weak link. Mm -hmm. And so within foot training, and, and again, this is just like my opinion, I think there's two pretty important things. And you saw we were doing a calf raise where you get like really into actually your big toe like yeah. bending, right? So that's, that's pretty awesome because someone would start that right now, okay? But the other thing that I think we really have to popularize and the guy who, so Louis also is, I think really got the sleds going. You know, I think Charles Poliquin learned about the sleds from Louis mm -hmm. and then Joe DeFranco learned about the sleds from Poliquin um, and, and Louis and Joe DeFranco called an, an HASD, a heavy ass sled drag. Now, now, DeFranco and I have become friends now. And so he's educated me that like for the beginner, so the heavy ass sled drag where you're dragging a super heavy sled, you actually need a little more body awareness and like should probably have a coach get you into that. But a, but a heavy ass sled drive, so I like that I can still call it just an HASD. Mm -hmm. A heavy ass sled drive, everyone who came here today did that. Isn't that pretty cool? Yeah, yeah. So when you take an exercise where everyone can get into it, and have a killer workout from it with no learning curve, now we're talking like that's how we change the world. Like, do I think it would change the world for basketball players for their coaches to have heavy ass sleds set up that they're not trying to move fast, that the weight is enough that it slows them down. Mm -hmm. And from the footage today, if people see the amount of toe and ankle bend, all of a sudden we get to throw out a lot of the arguments of, should we have ankle mobility or should we not have ankle mobility? Well go ahead and try to move a heavy sled. Your big toe is gonna to be bending and strengthening. Your ankle is gonna be bending and strengthening. And so for basketball players, just starting with, but I've, I, I think it's literally every human, yeah. we need stronger feet. We need more mobile feet, but we don't, need, we don't need more flexible, but weaker feet. And we don't necessarily need stronger, but stiffer feet that can, we need, holy crap, now from one movement an HASD, which I would call the number one movement for feet. But I already went over, there's a body weight alternative. So you don't have a sled, you can still start training FHL calf race, flexor, hallucius, longus, um, which is muscle that starts in our big toe. So with, with just a wall, so everyone listening to this can already start doing FHL calf raises. That's the second step when I'm trying to rebuild knees is actually getting the big toe bending, getting the calf stronger. And then we need to popularize because it's literally cheaper than a treadmill <laughs> to get a heavy sled. and and. Part, part of our whole, you know, part of my whole career is dedicated to making Charles Poliquin's genius turn that, you know, certain things from him into super accessible things. And he was so detailed, but people would ask him, you know, if you could only have one piece of equipment, what'd you have? Sled. So that heavy forward sled drive, which we did a ton of form coaching on, and what was the number one form coaching thing that you heard me just shouting and shouting, feet, 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 feet. If all you do is think about strong feet, because you could kind of, pigeon toe in or you could you could kind of let it crush your your ankle and and have a weak ankle and let your ass fly up or something you know basically if you just think about a strong foot and try to move a heavy sled that slows you down you have a low impact exercise that gets unbelievable cardio work capacity you can't even move it without your knee going over your toe and you seem to be bring up some clips of uh the dude that played for the steelers uh, james harrison um pushing the sled just so people can get a good a good uh, a good visual of that that would represent like what we were talking about the king of it versus the capacity of it so we were probably using somewhere like a, a medium oh yeah. yeah 
And his coach is uh, Ian uh, Denny. Also uh, a Charles Poliquin disciple. Yep, absolutely. So yeah, Charles, a lot <laughs> look of at that. Great look concepts, at that. Concepts. So this is so awesome because basketball <laughs> players can also be getting stronger. Basketball players can be getting stronger glutes, stronger legs, and stronger <laughs> feet. And basketball players, I know from working on them, they often, those feet can barely bend and they're in a lot of pain in their feet. A lot of pain. So you're going to... It's no Look coincidence that, that uh, James has happens. the uh, the greatest play in the history of uh, of, of the Super Bowl. He's got let's like this, this. sick ass uh, interception that he, he takes for a touchdown. So touch look now. at his knee over his toe. We're talking <laughs> way, but look at the foot. God. Look at the foot bending. Yep. This is the movement I think that humans need to add to the regimen. You know why? Because this past week, I also had my 64 year old dad doing it and winning with it. He loves that shit. It's really helped his feet. He can hike better. So my dad does one day backward sled and one day forward sled. Mm -hmm. I'm working on a program with him right now, two days a week, just for longevity. Since you've been here, I dragged the sled uh, probably four or five days a week. I, I've, I've always been a huge proponent of the sled. Mm -hmm. I trained at Westside Barbell. I was mentored by Louis Simmons, so I, I've known about it for a long time. Yep. Um, but when you started introducing a, me to a bunch of exercises, some of which I have never done before, the sled was the least complex thing for me to adopt to be able to do on a regular basis and the uh, tibialis raises yeah. and so i was like well those two things i mean it just doesn't make any sense for me not to do them and i actually enjoy them a lot and the sled i'm getting a lot of activity i'm partially getting in my steps in for the day um and it feels great and I you bet. don't need to we're, we're showing some excessive crazy stuff exactly you don't need to push these big boy weights for elderly holy crap is that important for society for elderly like elderly but not that you see that and yes. that's, and that's yes. where the disconnect is right and that's what my mission is and i'm gonna i need that needs to be common knowledge that elderly need to be doing hasds I don't no know. joke i don't know how to describe it but it's um slow at a way it, there's, it's, it's completely sick like there's I, i'm just trying to reference in, in something similar but it's it's very very safe i'm not saying mm -hmm. you can't hurt yourself with it's it hard it's to hurt, hurt yourself yeah it would though. be very difficult yeah and yeah. the amount of benefit you get from that one movement to yeah, correct you have to be trying to hurt yourself with those <laughs> if you tried to if you tried to run it, anybody listening you try to run with a sled or try to push one of those things mm -hmm. as fast as you can you will most likely hurt yourself if you're not conditioned for it. You yeah. intentionally had people do it slowly today. Exactly. So you want to use enough weight that it does slow you down, that you're leaning all your weight against it. So it's actually, I mean, it's almost like if you think about um, like a, a power lifter going for a maximum squat, right? That squat's trying to kill him. You know what I mean? <laughs> the, you know what I mean? The weight of it. Sled. It's just sitting there. Worst thing that happens, it wouldn't it wouldn't move, you know? And, it, and your, your body is bearing down on it mm. you know what i mean so i feel like there's something to that in terms of how um how risky it is you know what i mean and and that yeah we that's why we felt confident most of the stuff we did today was body weight yeah only there we loaded that mother up mm. isn't that interesting mm. and but we knew we could do that and no one got hurt no one i've ever been coaching on sleds has got hurt but i think i had to coach every single person to think about their feet when doing it yeah. I had a setback, you know, I, I was doing a lot of your stuff and I was following a lot of it. Um, I could have, you know, admittedly, I could have done more things. One thing I do find it really interesting is that you usually tell people to train these areas and to train these exercises uh, way less frequently than somebody might think would be prescribed. Yeah. A lot of times you're like, hey, one or two times a week is fine. Yeah. But anyway, I was I was training and doing some running and my shin slash knee started giving me some problems and just like one day it just got super shitty and I was like, oh my God, I don't know what the hell I did. You and I had some conversation. Yeah. We went back and forth and you said, hey, remember, you know, you need to be really kind to it. I was like excited. I was like, oh, he's going to give me all this exercise and I'm going to do them every day and I'm going to get all, you know, and I'm going to fix it as quick as I can. And you were like, hey, you know, just stick with the basics, uh, you know, don't overdo it. And anyway fast forward a couple of a uh, handful of weeks and I pretty much run almost every single day. I probably run <laughs> uh, five, six days a week, you know, former 330 pound power lifter. Wow. It's not a lot of running. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it's a decent amount, but it's not a lot of running, but wow. I'm out there running all the time. My knees feel fine. I had a friend tell me that, you know, if I was going to run on hard surfaces that I was 
no doubt going to get fucked up and maybe he's right maybe down the line i will uh but for right now i feel great i've never had more energy i've never felt better wow. i do still have and i i want to work on it and, and communicate with you more about it i do still have just a little bit of pain in my knee that's a little preventative for me wanting to get froggy and do certain kinds of things but other than that i feel fucking amazing that's awesome yeah and we were working on some of the stuff today we we're just looking at the big picture of it we're working on that, you know, slow single leg back extension, you know, going back and giving the tension there, that short range with the, the it's called the infinity loop or was it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and that thing, I, I think the reason I didn't like getting into that with the band is I didn't find it that comfortable and the band would kind of flip around like a regular band, like a, those jump, like a jump stretch band or, you know, whatever we call Pulls it. Pulls on your skin and stuff. Right. But then the infinity band today was, is so comfortable. All right. Um, that that makes a huge difference. So, yeah, and, and that's, if you think about what we're trying to do, your muscles, you can you can kind of, they can recover faster. So I think people often think that when it comes to knees over toes stuff, this kind of stuff, that's gonna be some like, do this all the time or your whatever. muscles recover faster than what? Your Ten, tendons, tendons and, lig and ligaments, okay. exactly. So if we just wanna be honest with, with what we're trying to improve, mm -hmm. then yeah, we have to be pretty gentle with it not crazy like so many of the stuff that people get you know hyped up about i do it like once a week you know what i mean yeah as part of a, a well-rounded thing letting that thing recover and i think people are wanting to hear just do this one thing every day and it's more about creating your long-term your full long-term plan like you mentioned the stuff that you gravitated and actually were using is stuff you liked doing mm -hmm. you know so um i think that's how someone's going to get the best results in the long term is gradually building those capacities finding you know the ways they can get into it so yeah that's why like today we're working at other angles of getting in and around that so now you're kind of adding to your arsenal yeah. that you could spread out have a you know full schedule but i think we'd be maybe there would be some you know shocking quick cases but we'd be dishonest with the process of what we're trying to improve if we tried to just you know go at it with a shotgun super frequently and stuff can you tell us about some of the benefits of Nordic hamstring curls? Because when you came here in February, I wasn't able to do like, I was able to do a rep, it was kind of dirty. But since I've been progressing those and I worked through the progressions that you, you know, you've, you've outlined, like I can hop into a dead sprint a hundred percent. I don't feel in danger at all. It's like, it's given me so much resiliency. It's, it's crazy. So can you tell us how that movement can be beneficial for athletes that are looking to progress it over time? Yeah. I'm so glad you brought up that one because that one actually has had a bunch of studies done on it and has stood up to the test. You know what I mean? That even your most scientific literature, you know what I mean, type person, um, that that exercise, many physiotherapists think is like like the best exercise to protect your knee. But it even has studies showing like 50% reduction of hamstring injury, yeah. right? That is a long range exercise. So I was just talking about with Mark about and, and if they bring up visuals of this, it's such a simple learning point to realize that with the the infinity loop, when you hug it in with the hamstring and you pull it in in a, in a, in a hamstring curl, the toughest part there is the easiest part of the Nordic. So the Nordic, before you've started lowering, mm -hmm. there's no tension yet. Then as you lower down and it gets close, it gets into that longer range. So now you're putting you know extreme tension through that longer range. That's usually like how we get hurt, yeah, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so, so, but that's a bulletproofing exercise. And so many people, fortunately that one has had so much literature on it, but tons of people say like, oh, I tried that once and I couldn't walk for a week or so, you know what I mean? But that's the kind of person who honestly is gonna have a really hard time in life. You know what I mean? If they think that that's like how you get somewhere mm -hmm. in life. And so I think that's such a good movement because I think that sheds some light on why, I mean, they, they got, footage today but the amount of people who came in today and told me how this like changed their life or prevented them having a knee surgery or something it's unbelievable like i'm gonna ride a high that the rest of the year the amount of people that came up to me and had like you know practically choking up you know what i mean were able to cancel a knee surgery or something like 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 extreme stuff but they tended to be the people you could tell they like they really understood the process of what was going on mm -hmm. and i think that because the nordic hamstring curl is so studied and understood and it's clearly a long range exercise it just fits in and explains the like you know what my system is going after it's going after a system of short range to pump areas and long range to bulletproof areas with regression so that those long range scary things aren't so scary mm. so yeah nordic 
absolutely proven. It's putting you where you're weakest and where you'd have the most difficulty. And actually, when, when Mark and I worked on it in March, remember, I didn't have you do short range. Mm -hmm. And today we did. And the short range felt great, right? Yep. So there's not pressure on someone to go into the long range. But you would have an understanding that if Mark wanted to go out and sp like full on sprint, well, there's going to be some risk in sprinting. And the better he is at a Nordic, the less risk there's being in sprinting. But getting into a Nordic, there's going to be some risk in that. But he can use the short range to mitigate that risk, to get more blood and healing to the area, and then gradually progress. And that's what we're doing as well today for people is then showing them, you know, how the Nordic itself scales and just just work slowly on the way down, push your way back up, mm -hmm. and put that little money in the bank towards the resiliency. Mm -hmm. So, but that concept, look, if that concept works for one area of the body, what do you think the, the rest of your body, you know what I mean, somehow works differently, you know what I mean? Yeah. The way that muscles and tendons and ligaments work. So I think the fact that Nordic has been so studied is just a really good indicator of like why we're, you know, why we're getting all these results. Kind of like in line with that, um, a lot of people, like I've, I've mentioned the seated, um, seated good morning that you talk yep. about. And those, a lot of people see those movements like the Jefferson curl. Um, Scary shit. It scares the hell out of them. Yeah. Um, can like can you talk about why those movements can actually be safe on the lower back? Because people feel that if you move into that range, it automatically is unsafe for your lower back. Yeah. Why is that actually helping the lower back in the long run? I think the lower back needs a podcast in itself mm. because I think the lower back is like one of the most misunderstood areas that people are kind of like, knock on wood, I had a certain adjustment or I tried some this or I tried some that. So. Um, it does follow some of the other principles, but other areas are easier. Like our wrist is like our ankle, right? Wrist, ankle, they like, they, they do similar function. Mm -hmm. Elbows and knees, really similar. Hips now get into like these rotations and shoulders. So I feel like hips and shoulders actually get like even more confused. And now your spine's in between and people are just like, <laughs> like knocking on, they're like knocking on wood that, you know what I mean? Like that they haven't hurt their back. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people are also suffering with really bad chronic pain for the back. They can't sleep. So we had a guy come here today. And so he thought that because of all the stuff we're doing in the joints, he thought, I'm going to go to Ben and see if he has some advice for my back. He's getting an, he's getting an MRI on his back tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Meaning like he's in that much pain. He was deadlifting like six months ago. <laughs> the, probably, you know, bad form this you know the same same old stories and but crap it's still better idea to be strong than to go through life with no muscle tissue you know what i mean yeah. but the point is um you know probably went too far with bad form on a deadlift and since that point it's just gotten really bad for him okay and all i want to say about that is that i said okay and i took him right over to do an exercise and he was able to do it with no pain and we got on a back extension machine uh -huh. And I let him have his back relax all the way. And that's in the family of Jefferson Curl. Mm -hmm. Jefferson Curl would go towards more elite levels of that. We also use very light weights. I can actually do heavy weights in it now, but I got there on the capacity. And I only did the heavy weight because it gets a ton of views. But you haven't seen me do it recently. Like I'm, I'm trying to just help people. So I, what I put on social media is just calculated whether I have to reach some people. I have to, so, but have you seen me do a heavy Jefferson Curl in no. forever? No, but I've done it. I just haven't posted it. You know, some of my mo some of my most my my social media growth has actually slowed down since I stopped posting freaky shit that I can do. But you guys saw me today. I can still do the freaky shit. Yeah. So the point is that a Jefferson curl looks scary, but so you know, bending down to pick up a pencil, we start people on the Jefferson curl with absolutely no weight, and then they hold like you know five pounds or this or that. And we only try to get to twenty five percent of their body weight, and we don't even make them go past that because if you can't bend down to get something a quarter of your weight, like certain objects you can't pick up like with the square back, like just based on the nature of it. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Look at strong men like having to pick up like a, like a ball or something. They're going like knees over toes and rounded back. But the, the farther we go into these extreme ranges, yes, there is more risk. So something like a Jefferson curl, someone shouldn't go like mess with. But with the back extension, it's a pretty light amount of tension, you know? And it's pretty cool that they're in like all gyms and that it, it holds your form in for you. Let, go down and relax. Jefferson Curl takes a lot of form attention and this and that. So with a back extension, you go down and, and relax at the bottom and takes no effort, no form coaching. You know what I mean? Just relax. And then gradually go up until that back is straight. And what keeps it really simple is if you can squeeze your glutes together, there's tension on the back. Mm. 
what's that position there? That's the short range. When we go down and relax, what's that? That's the long range. And then we go up and then we gradually take a foot out. Now all the load is on one side. And then you do a rep, you relax down, you come back up and then you slowly put the other foot in, take the foot out, then do a rep on the other side. So now we're, we're working the back in the long range, in the short range. We're able to get some balance between sides. Our hamstring, our glute all connects. We're able to, you know, people are often, it's almost like if you took all the different ideas, oh, like the back, you got to get this, you got to get, we're getting a lot in one movement now that's in like every gym is these simple 45 degree back extensions. <clears throat> but when I see people doing back extensions in gyms, they're just bouncing around. Mm. So, so it's how you do it. I, I've never gone into a gym and seen someone doing the back extension the way that I'm talking about. And so here's a guy who's having an MRI on his back tomorrow. It's so bad and can't sleep through the night and this and that. And he's able to get into what I think is the number one back exercise on day one. That's pretty cool with the first time. And he's able to get a great burn in the muscles. But with that, what's so cool about that equipment is we're able to get the long range and the short range and balance sides in a single movement. So I would put that into that family of like heavy forward, you know, heavy ass sled drives of like, you know, if it's done right, it's pretty dang simple. The risk is very low. The reward is super high. So I think, I think that correctly, <clears throat> and maybe correct isn't even the right word, but maybe um, um, learning how to patiently dominate a back extension, and and patiently dominate getting that that foot and knee over toe with the HASD. Those are two things that I have to to push and popularize a lot more. When can you, you can you bring up a Jefferson curl? I sure. Do? And then uh, as I do that, though, when you're saying relax at the bottom, that would destroy me. The only part of the back extension that doesn't hurt is the flexing and like holding in the middle because everything is tight. If I relax anything in my back, it's like a very dangerous spot for me. I wish we got him on film earlier um, because there's there's still ways to regress it. Mm -hmm. And... You're putting, rather than, so like a Andrew and I have been talking and we were going to work on his back today. We haven't had a chance yet. Mm. And so he was kind of at a point where he was told like, you can't lift for like X amount of time. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think that's a death wish. Okay. I think it's one of the worst things that's ever happened in like exercise science is when people get these blanket statements. A recommendation from yeah. Stuart McGill, by the way, mm -hmm. just to kind of give people reference of like, it doesn't matter who you are. Not everybody knows everything. And the recommendation from Stuart McGill could be good information, but I would have to agree. There was another gentleman that came to me too with a back thing. And I immediately showed him the Jefferson deadlift. I was like, what are you doing for your back? He's like, I, I not really much cause it hurts. And he said he was doing lunges and other, I was like, that's great. You're doing these other exercises, but, and we did talk earlier about, uh, you know, uh, working around the area, but sometimes in the, in the case of something like the lower back, it's like, well, let's figure out a way to address it so we can pump a ton of blood into it. And I just had him, he was only holding a 15 pound weight. Um, rounding your back, by the way, is totally safe. It's totally fine. What, what, where the mistake is being made is that when you go to just set up on a heavy deadlift, your back can round. There are individuals that break world records with a slightly rounded back. The thing is, is that you can't continuously lose and give up more position as you do the lift. That is a great way to eventually at some point probably have your luck run out and hurt yourself. So That's great advice. And I, I don't think people have, quite know what you're saying is that yeah. you start with a certain posture. And then as you go, the muscles are not capable. And now the back rounds. Yeah, you don't want to turn into like a fishing rod. Where you know, some, where some power lifters, they know how to start from a certain position and they explode and then hold from that there. Position. And, and they're also these, they're also breaking <clears throat> world records. At the amount of capacity they've built up for that, you know what I mean? They're is, professional. Exactly. So it's the same thing as you know. To Michael Jordan, his knee was like way over his toe. You know, but doesn't mean like forcing it. But I mean, anyways, it's you're right. You could probably if you took just a blanket thing and you had people like just start rounding the back and exercising the muscles. You know what I mean? As a blanket thing, you'd probably get far better results than just giving blanket advice of don't move the area. But with that back extension and, and for Andrew, we'll test, we'll, we'll go out and work on it here, right? Because it's so controlled, you don't have to stand and balance. You don't have to hold weight, anything like that. Because it's so controlled, like he said, like there was a part of, of it that he could do or something yeah, like that. As long as I have tension on it, I can 
almost do anything. It's just sometimes it's impossible. Exactly. And so we could we could use that mm -hmm. to start building tension in the areas he could handle. And and that was one that I also, thanks to my fragile dad, <laughs> you know, <laughs> he loves the back extension. But we, I told him, and I said, Dad, go in there and do one rep tonight. No joke. So my, my dad built up his back by going and doing one back extension. I kid you not. And then like like I made it like then rest the next day. And then he did like two or something like that. Mm -hmm. But but we can find those areas and then actually like give you a thorough workout. Mm -hmm. And that's where I just see that long term. I see that if you look at really broad statistics, when we just completely avoid problems and like don't put in the work, you cannot expect the result from that. You're gonna have to put in the work. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I firmly believe you you can't cheat the grind when it comes to trying to build up an area of your body. And so when it comes to the back, for example, we have to find those zones that you can work and then we have to give you a workout. And I'm not kidding, the amount of people I've had who are like back pain was like ruining their dang life. And that simple building to the single legged style, because I think that also partly prevents us from trying to go too heavy. Because now instead of progressing from two legs to weight, we're progressing from two legs to one leg. So I think it just forces us to take more time. And I think our, I think most of us kind of have some jacked up imbalances too. So I mm -hmm. think there could Big be time. something to that. Yeah. So the amount of people I've had who said like, said like nothing else worked for me and that worked, it's high enough that we sure as heck need to popularize it and work it more and get more fragile people mm -hmm. using it and find, you could, you could change millions of lives. Mm -hmm. My back has never been as fucked up as yours, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and that's why I'm knees over toes guy, <laughs> you know? Uh, it doesn't matter how good I am at the back because I'll never know to the core of me unless it's from people like you doing it, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So that should be your mission is, and, and it doesn't mean to only try that thing, but I think it's good timing to say, okay, let's look at this simple old back extension that anyone could get in front of their TV. And if you're like me and you don't own a TV, well then you just save the money for the back extension right there. <laughs> and so I think we should really get in on that back extension and find what can you do on that and you know get that workout in and see if we can get a breakthrough in. Mm -hmm. And then when I was working with that guy, I then showed how, how directly from that same piece of equipment, the other area our back gets effed up is those quadratus lumborum muscles mm. that are not the lower ab, not the lower back in between the two. Yeah. And so many of our back injuries have come not on a straight line in life, but getting into any kind. It's, it's, per, it's one of those muscles that most people have never trained and they're not stretching and strengthening the QLs. And so you do it and you realize you're like a total newbie at it. Mm -hmm. Now imagine building up pecs, lats, glutes, all these areas, but still having the same QLs you did when you were 18 and Jeez. you bench 95 pounds. That's where we get into trouble. It's like our own weakest links. And so right from that same equipment, and I, I did this and I demoed it, and fortunately someone was filming. But basically when it comes to your back with that one piece of equipment, we can actually work in every direction, mastering our own body weight. Now, depending on the demands you wanna go into, like how you had that guy start holding weight, he probably deadlifts, right? He's probably like, so I think there's gonna be a bridge between what I'm talking about and deadlifting. And I think some clues are gonna be left by Tommy Kono. You know what I'm talking about? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, Tommy Kono in his book, you can see him doing what I'm doing right there with like hundreds of pounds, okay? Tommy Kono. And Tommy Kono's longevity was unparalleled. He's the most successful American <laughs> weightlifter of all time. Right. Okay, and he did an intentionally rounded back deadlift. But again, that's just going into an area where it's gonna scare people off. But but don't take, don't get scared off by that. Get, in, get interested in the genius and the success that came from that and then figure out how to apply that at your level. And to me, that's, that's my passion for the back extension. The back extension is just getting, making it ex more accessible for people to get those bulletproof back. Yeah, and Seema, you're gonna dig Tommy Kono, I'm telling you. So if we take Tommy Kono, most, most successful American Olympic weightlifter of all time, mm -hmm. Well, the guy was successful, you know? We have to be willing to look at the genius of others. It's like over 100 years old or something, right? <laughs> I, he was known for great longevity, that's yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. And he firmly believed in intentionally training this rounded I, I back deadlift. I want to say he might even be like local. I don't know. Maybe I'm making that up. Um, I think you would have a lot of fun looking into Tommy Kono. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the point is just that the back extension for me makes it accessible for people to get stronger and more mobile backs and go get a workout. It's kind of like, so now we've got, you know, like like the backward sled, the HASD, the back extension. These are things that if you learn how to do them, you can literally get anyone into it and benefiting, you know, elderly, 
or for me, I swear by it because it helps me for like top end speed and one foot jumping because not just the burst, but now you're getting strong. Did you, I worked Mark on it today and see how you rack up a lot of time under tension mm -hmm. with the back in that short range. And that's what I'm thinking for Andrew. Andrew might have to be working a lot more short range at first, but maybe he finds that if he puts his hands on it and like keeps tension, maybe he can go a little, little deeper and then an inch deep. But I'm telling you that the way you get the way you, you bridge that is not by avoiding the area, and it, that that tends to make things decay further. If you don't get blood to the area, it's not going to get better. Yeah. If you want a short-term problem, try to blast it too hard. If you want a long-term, if you want to create a long-term disaster, just avoid a problem completely. You know what I mean? So I, I think with that back extension, I think we can get Andrew gradually facing and confronting his back and, and actually building it up and mm -hmm. working it and strengthening it because it's going to build muscle there too you know yeah that, so i mean that's it gives me something to look forward to and you know uh student radio gave me way more than what you know just don't do anything but his thing was you're you can walk you can do the mcgill big three he's like and that's all you do until you can until you can feel no pain from that then you can start lifting but then there's a progression for that and i mean it's it's really hard for me not to lift so it, it's what you just said about like take do, the genius of that yeah, but what you just said was like, you know, if you want to have a really bad issue, blast it. If you want to have like, a, you know, a worse issue, don't do anything. And yeah. that's what I saw. And I'm just like, dude, I, I can't not touch weights. Like, yeah. it's just, it's a part of me that's fucking impossible. You still so, have pain doing the big three? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, actually yeah. just doing the movements. Yeah. But, but this, I believe, could help bridge that gap. Mm -hmm. Meaning I'm not saying to not do the big three. You see what I mean? Yeah. I'm not saying to not do the big three, but I'm telling you, like, I don't. I would also say maybe like not lifting is maybe that's still a good recommendation mm -hmm. because who says you have to lift? You well, have to figure out how to get blood to the well, area. And may, maybe don't deadlift, right? But maybe you know like there's probably maybe it's a, a six pound kettlebell. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. probably a lot. There's probably a lot you could do. Right. Mm -hmm. And now with the back extension, you actually can be working your back at an area that you're there. Like you're not going to get into trouble. Mm -hmm. Like you can control where you're going with it. You know what I mean? You can start working the ranges mm -hmm. that you can do and gradually building up that way. And that, that would actually directly potentiate you to get back into something like deadlifts. Like you're actually getting your back, you know, into those positions. So he's probably right to not be deadlifting. Mm -hmm. um, but, but even then, that would be a subject that someone could speak on much better than me because I don't deadlift. Like part of what I do is I just do this shit so that I know what is occurring from this stuff. And... Uh, and, and perhaps, you know, an excellent deadlifting coach could even be scaling something. Perhaps it's like, um, you know, using an elevated trap bar or something. I don't, I'm just, again, I, this is mm -hmm. not my opinion. I'm just saying that perhaps a, a, a specific deadlifting coach has a lot of success with back cases at what kind of deadlift mm -hmm. they could be doing in the meantime. Yeah. But, but I think in, in my zone, in getting into these short and long ranges, you know, how do we get in there? How do we rebalance? That's, that's my zone right there. And so I, I think the back extension, I think, um, I think you should dive in. You should, yeah. you should keep me posted. You should figure out a protocol. You can help a lot of people. If you can figure shit out, you can help a lot of people. Yeah. And it's one, I mean, I've tried a lot of things and that's one I haven't. So I'm really looking forward to that. And that's why I've been liking the biomechanics stuff that I learned recently is like, I'm able to train and not really hurt anything, but I'm not getting better. Yeah. And then as far as like, and this will be the end of it, but like, you know, doing like, it's sort of like sitting around waiting for something to happen as opposed to going out and making it happen. Mm -hmm. That's how I feel with like doing just like these warm up movements all day long, hoping that it gets better versus doing something like with a back extension where mm -hmm. it's like, no, like I have a task today yep. and that's what I'm going to go out and do. And then I'm yeah. going to, you know, get and, better and at measure it. and see your yes, progress. Exactly. It. It's very hard when you don't have any way to like measure yep, and, and see your progress. And then you go, and then you go, fuck yeah, I did. I went, I did three today I did five you know what I mean mm -hmm. and then what does that do to your hormones and stuff which is the very thing that then helps get you even more gains mm -hmm. you know um so yeah I'm, I'm excited for you to dive into the back Thank extension you. um yeah if my 64 year old dad like basically my dad's like the stubborn guy that you can't get to try any exercise and that has been the <laughs> best thing I'm telling you like I'm phase two of my career phase one of my career I think actually like I owe a lot to my mom because she was very willing to try stuff, you know what I mean. And now my mom's sixty-seven, and I like I post a video it's like she's sprinting. Okay, yeah. my mom is sprinting at sixty-seven, but at sixty-four she was struggling to get out of bed. Mm. Her hip was so bad, and so if her hip was that bad already at sixty-four, like I was worried about her. You know what I mean? And that had a lot to do with 
the regressions that we use now on, on split squats and stuff like that. And now she has like a great split squat and her hips are great and she can sprint. So yeah, phase one of my career, thanks to my mom, <laughs> phase two of my career is going to be, cause we can all relate to my dad oh, where yeah. it's like, we'd rather not even mess with it than go get hurt doing something. People, please make sure you listen to the first episode that we did with Ben, where we just covered tons of stuff. Mm. Um, I want to ask you this question, and, and maybe ensema has got like one more, but I know we're really getting mm. kind of pressed for time. Um, tell me about your wife. Like, she's involved in a lot of the videos, and like, um, was this something that was talked about early on in your relationship? Like, I don't know how long you've been doing the kind of like the knees over toes stuff and how long you've been married and so forth, but. Um, I got to get my wife on a podcast. It's going to be a lot more entertaining than me because, uh, because <laughs> we, we, I mean, we went to elementary school together. What? Yeah. Aww. Seven, eight, nine years old. <laughs> then I didn't see her for like 10 years and she went off to school and. Um, I like saw her in a cafe, just started hitting on her, got rejected. I got rejected a couple of times. Anyways, eventually she went out on a date with me. Ben, what the hell position <laughs> is this? Buddy? Wow. It's the seated good morning never looked so uh, awesome. Uh, you know, some, some, views. some decisions weren't the best. <laughs> okay. Um, and, and I really think I need to popularize the back extension yeah. a lot more than that. Mm. You know, like I, like. What makes me good is that I'm going to look at me back in March. I'm going to look at me yesterday and I'm going to be like, I, I can get a lot better than that guy, mm -hmm. you know, because I'm not going to be spending my time trying to justify what I did. Yeah, There's tips. no ego. Tips so, could be bigger. I mean, <laughs> you could have bigger tips. So, so my wife, so we started dating. I was 19. So she's been with me through this whole thing. She's been with me when I was icing my knees four times a day. And she's with me through like all the experiments and trying to get there. And I remember like going to a basketball court and she was so unimpressed. It was like the most demoralizing thing. Like I couldn't dunk. I like, like she like, but, but she still believed in me the whole time, you know, and it, it, it might even seem like a cliche thing, but not just having people around you who pat you on the back or whatever and say you can do it, but people that are as crazy as you are to really actually believe you can do it, you know? And that's a special thing to have someone around you actually believe. She she always believed in me. Like she was believing that I was going to, years out of high school, that I was somehow going to get a college basketball scholarship and stuff like that. She always believed in it. And so she got to see the whole evolution and how it like gradually turned into then fixing my knees and then being able to jump high and then, um, and then you know, helping others with it. Why and, is she part of the videos? Well, for one thing, she was a, competitive figure skater growing up. That's what like attracted us to each other initially is just the fact that even dating back to when we were nine years old, we were both crazy. At, we were the only like kids at our little school in our little town who like I was trying to be a basketball player. She was trying to be a figure skater. And we were both like super dedicated by nine years old or something. So, I mean, for a chick to be like super dedicated to sport by nine years old, like she understands me on, just on a different level that I don't think someone could if they hadn't been like dedicated towards something like that. But anyways, so... Um, so we've always also wanted her to like be getting back into skating and stuff. And recently she's like getting back into mm -hmm. skating and she looks unbelievable out there. And I think that's something cool. Like, like, like Mark, you have powerlifting, but like, what about my wife who is like figure skating was a huge part of her life. And now 10 years go by without skating. You know what I mean? How happy she was to see her back on the ice and not just back on the ice, but not in pain, able to move her body and skate and this and that. Like, you know, we have to commend ourselves for that. You know what I mean? Like, you know, even if I'm not playing in a pro basketball game, I have to commend myself and, and be able to experience that joy of playing with my friends. And I got to play with my friends the other weekend, elevate, pull up, jumper, game winner. No one cares. You know what I mean? <laughs> but it's like, you know, we're all just running our own lives. And, and like that felt really good for me. And so for her, that was kind of the initial thing is after having the baby and stuff was like, we want to like, like get her back in shape to actually land the best figure jump of her life. What's the uh, engagement like having her on there as well? Are people inspired? Cause I noticed people a lot like of times. People like her a lot more than me. I know. I noticed a lot of times she's doing a scaled version, which she probably doesn't need, especially being a she high doesn't. level figure skater, but she, it helps people connect the dots. What are the comments saying? Yeah. I mean, the, the analytics have just been so much better when I'm showing something, but then she's showing like the lowest level of it. Because I think that basically your chance of educating that person, the average person, okay? Mm. If you're even listening to this, you're probably not the average person. You know what I mean? But the average person, I probably have five seconds to educate them. So like the, the opening thing they see, um, 
that really helped my channel like blast off was actually getting my wife in the videos. And now she's raising our kids. Like I wish she was more consistent or this or that, but we're like, we're not going to give up on it. We're going to keep training together. Uh, she's going to keep skating and we're going to keep showing, you know, with the two of us, boom, right onto the screen. The exercises have different levels. Is she involved in the business? It looks like a lot of times you're she's more involved in the business than me, basically. Mm. So like she is the, like the, badass business biatch you know like like she turns my ideas and drive into like a strong business ah uh, like some of the things you shared with me which we're not allowed to talk about <laughs> so um so yeah so it's and we're we're so different that it's actually like kind of perfect because all my weakest links are her strongest links and probably vice versa and so it's like like i i realize that like we're almost never both wrong about something like if i'm wrong about something it's usually something in her skill set and she's like right about it. I go, oh shit like you know thank god so yeah that's that's how we work she's she's doing the hard phone calls and setting up you know mm. the badass insurance and talking to lawyers and doing you know what i mean and like and doing the you know the taxes and this and that and, like she's um and, and funny enough she loves that she loves business and i hated business and it's why I became a really good trainer because if you if you hate business and you suck at business and you want to like survive you better be getting like serious results and that was like my strategy is like I was just going to try to results my way you know to success and not care about the business and not care about social media she's the one who told me like you need to post on TikTok you know and this was like when I wasn't even on TikTok and not that I mean and Seaman knows my TikTok sucks but I still have That's good ben. he tries to give about? me tips on it um and seem is killing on TikTok, and he's a genius. And but I have over four hundred thousand followers there because she, you know, told me to post on TikTok. Like she, she's a like much better business mind. Than you me. find yourself kind of like loving her more every day. Like are you kind of like <laughs> taken back and like because sometimes you I take love it her more now than I did ten years. Yeah, ago. right. Like and sometimes you take it for granted, like the great things that she's doing and and the relationship. Yeah. But every once in a while, it like hits you. You're like, damn, that's like. This is like yeah. beyond, like it's beyond special. Yeah, I couldn't, I mean, not that every relationship has to go that way, but I couldn't have more respect for the fact that she's like dove in and so great for my business. Mm -hmm. You know, that's like, that's that's so cool, you know? Filled in my weakest links, um, dives into those videos, you know what I mean? And, and that's, that's nothing, her diving into the videos. And then, you know, not to mention she's like, you know, uh, doing hard phone calls while breastfeeding at the same time, <laughs> stuff, you know? I love it. Yeah. So I got something, buddy. I think that's a beautiful place right All there. Right. That's a beautiful. How about school. you and your wife? But yeah, I, I love my wife. I fucking more can't stand now. her. Andrew, <laughs> take us on out of here, buddy. <laughs> awesome. Thank you guys so much for checking out today's episode. If you made it this far, then you obviously got some value out of it. So please hit that like button and uh, yeah, give us a shout out in the uh, comments. Please follow the podcast at Mark Bell's Power Project on Instagram at MB Power Project on TikTok and Twitter. My Instagram and Twitter's at I am Andrew Z at the Andrew Z on TikTok and Seema, where are you at? Yeah, guys, make sure to go check out Ben's stuff. It's changed my knees in my life. So check it out. Adam Seema Inny on Instagram and YouTube. Adam Seema Yin Yang on TikTok and Twitter. Ben? Knees over toes, guy. Just Google it. <laughs> Yo, I got to give some props to our buddy. These, uh, these cookies, cut, cutting edge keto mm -hmm. from Delicious. our boy Brian. Keto he cookies. did a fantastic uh, job. These things are amazing. Absolutely delicious. Uh, what's 100, the, 100, what's the, 100 calories uh, what's each. the website? Oh, here we go. You got something on there? Very um, delicious. The website. I'm probably cutting into uh, keto.cam, probably maybe on this yeah. card. Is it on the card? On, probably got to be on the card. Cutting, right, it better be on the card. Oh, yeah, yeah. Edge. Cutting edge keto LLC.com. There you go. And he probably, he should have social media, but cutting edge keto LLC.com. Yo, he gave me some these to me one day. He gave me six. So actually six or seven. Mm. I ate one. And the cool thing is, like, he makes it, you know, the packaging is pretty hard to open. I ate all Thank of them goodness. at once. I couldn't, I couldn't save any for the next day. So just understand that these taste so good that... It, and the cookies are small, too. So if you're trying to count your calories and stuff like that, I don't know the exact stats, but... 100 it calories. It tasted good. Yeah, oh, 100 they're 100 calories, calories yeah. yeah. The peanut butter one has, uh, like, 150. Can you get to try one, Ben? Delicious. Yeah, they're freaking great. They're amazing. Is it up to me now? I'm yep, out of here? Yep. Yeah. Shout, shout out to Mark, Mark bringing all of us together.
Yeah, what an amazing uh, time. That was that was freaking awesome. Very motivating, inspiring to do more seminars. So look for that to come pretty soon. And I do love my wife very much. I was just messing around. She she um, was running the show today, yeah, too. She I was, was really impressed to see she her She was action. rocking. You're a lucky mother. I am. Yeah. I am very lucky, very fortunate. Something uh, that I learned long ago, which might sound extremely corny, but I think for people that are in it, that are in love, that have been in love uh, for a long time, I think a great question question you can ask yourself each day is how can I love this person more? How can I help provide uh, more for this person and more for my family? Wow. It's uh, not an easy thing to figure out <laughs> how to always dump more into those areas. But uh, I've personally found that uh, putting more time and more love into other people is as you're doing uh, very often um, is a great way to not be in your own head and when you're in your own head, sometimes the thoughts that you start to think uh, are kind of dark and it starts to take you down maybe the wrong path. And so if you feel like you're in that space, simply uh, invest some time in other people, figure out a way that you can help them. Strength is never weakness. Weakness is never strength. We are out of here. Catch you guys later.